When I first started getting into lean construction and looking more into what this is and where it came from, all roads led back to Berkeley where you are. University of California, Berkeley. University of California, Berkeley. Go Bears. Go Bears. <laughs> so, so many people that I've bumped into over my time in construction, and I've been two decades in, have either benefited directly from your tutelage or your education training with you, or been inspired by papers that you've helped to create, or through your work with P2SL or IGLC, or the Lean Construction Institute, just so many places. You're just such a big influence. And I've recently got onto this whole path on newer and better ways to schedule work, such as Scrum, TACT, and of course, Last Planner System, where a lot of us first get our feet wet when we start diving into Lean. What do you have to say for yourself for all these people you're inspiring, Iris? <laughs> Well, it's been a fortunate fortune to work with everyone. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice to work with people who are eager to learn and open to new ideas. Welcome to the EBFC show, the easier, better for construction podcast. I'm your host, Felipe Engineer Manriquez. This show is all about the business of construction. Today's episode is sponsored by Bosch Refine My Site is a cloud-based construction collaboration platform that applies lean principles to enable your entire team to plan, communicate, and execute in real time. It's the digital tool that works in tandem with your last planner system process and puts it all together in one simple collaborative ecosystem system. This easy to use platform is available in English, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and French and can be used on desktops, tablets, and mobile devices. According to Spencer Easton, scheduling manager at Oakland Construction, Refine My Site, in my opinion, is the best, leanest tool on the market for the last time it's Here's what our users have to say. We've looked at three other digital scheduling platforms and none compare to the straightforward approach Refine My Site takes. From milestone planning all the way down to daily tasks, this program gives every general contractor and their trade partners meaningful collaboration, accountability, and KPIs. Register today to try Refine My Site for free for 60 days. Today's show is also sponsored by the Lean Construction Institute. LCI is working to lead the building industry and in transforming its practices and culture. Its vision is to create a healthy and thriving industry that delivers outstanding project outcomes every time for everyone. Check the show notes for more information. Now, to the show. Welcome to the show, Dr. Iris Tomlin. Iris, thank you so much for coming onto the show and sharing with the world as you've impacted so many students that I've come across, including in Germany, in Sweden, South America, Finland. What countries am I missing? California. California could almost be a country, could it not? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. It's part of the United States. So please tell everybody, tell the good people of the internet how you got started with becoming a doctor and a major influencer in the construction movement worldwide. Well, <laughs> It's been a while. I don't quite have all the gray hair to show for it, but um, I've been at it a little longer than the two decades you've been in. Um, it's more than three and a half decades, I guess, that I've been in the industry. Um, I was born and raised in Belgium and have a five-year civil engineer architect degree from the Free University in Brussels. Um, I had the opportunity at the end of my fourth year to do an internship for a construction company. And I ended up working for the White's company in Des Moines, Iowa. I had an absolutely terrific project manager who would take you know, the, the various students who were there, including me along to project sites. And it really opened my eyes to um, what it means to run a good project. So when I finished my degree in Belgium, I uh, was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to study for a master's degree in the United States. Uh, I ended up at Stanford and earned a master's in construction engineering and management. And while there, um, one of the faculty, Ray Levitt, um, had just returned from a sabbatical in Silicon Valley learning about artificial intelligence. And so he twisted my arm to study how we might be using artificial intelligence and apply it to problems in the domain of construction. 
Um, this is 1985, so it's uh, it's quite a few years ago for as popular as artificial intelligence is today. Um, we've, you know, we have, we, we started a long time ago, but uh, the technology wasn't quite um, as fast and as, um, uh, as powerful, of course, as it is today. So uh, it's been very exciting to see how our capabilities have been changing over time. But uh, Ray convinced me to work on the problem of site layout planning, looking at how construction managers lay out temporary facilities on construction site. It is a very gnarly problem, uh, both from an academic standpoint as well as from a practical standpoint. So he sent me out to the Gemba to go to a couple of construction sites and talk to project managers and superintendents to find out how they were doing site layout. He also sent me to a conference on artificial intelligence in Los Angeles. And on the plane, I met some people who were very instrumental in working in artificial intelligence at Stanford. And then I met uh, one of the faculty, Barbara Hayes Roth, uh, at the conference. And she invited me when we got back to Stanford to come talk to her about how we might use the rule-based system that she was working on, the Blackboard system she was working on at the time, and try it out for the site layout problem. So it was a very, a very interesting time, a very exciting time. Um, the time of the first uh, Macintosh computers with 512K of memory. Wow, the glory <laughs> days. <laughs> which, which we were wildly enthusiastic about because you could put it in your backpack and carry it around. And it had all these wonderful fonts <laughs> you could <laughs> play with. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so anyway, I, I worked on site layout. I looked at the literature. I talked to people in industry to learn how we could do it better. I developed an interesting program, um, which of course at the end had to be validated. And I remember the project manager from from uh, Bechtel Construction who came and, and uh, looked at my program, kind of crunching away at trying to figure out what laid on yard needed to go in which location. And the first thing he basically said, oh, Iris, can I grab the mouse and <laughs> move things around? <laughs> Which, of course, totally violated this whole idea about we're going to automate this and take take it out of people's hands. <laughs> <laughs> so I realized we, we had work to do. We also had work to do from, a, from an academic sense because, you know, in project management, we talk about managing resources and the resources that we manage are materials, manpower and machines, and then, of course, time and money. And lo and behold, I had spent years working on my PhD, worrying about the resource space. And it dawned on me at the time that it was rather ironic that it wasn't even mentioned in the textbooks on project management, that space needed to be managed because the problem of managing space very much was delegated to people in the field. And, and that's where um, all the decisions were made. So, you know, I, I realized something was missing from the, the bigger picture in project management. Um, I joined the faculty at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor as an assistant professor. Actually, I was in the same cohort as uh, Jeff Leiker, who um, joined the industrial engineering faculty, and Al Ward, who joined mechanical engineering. And there were several other uh, faculty who came from, from different places. Bill Birmingham, one of my colleagues in electrical engineering, computer science. Uh, we're sort of all of the same cohort hired from various universities working on artificial intelligence problems and and especially jeff uh, and al working on social technical systems right so really understanding that we have this automation but people are always want to will always want to hold the mouse and, <laughs> and try to do something different in case the computer doesn't do what they have in mind so we were we were kind of on the same wavelength um as for my own interest, I branched out at, at Michigan from kind of the site layout problem into materials management and then several years later into supply chain management, really um, trying to understand the bigger the bigger picture problems. But what's interesting to know about, about the timeline um, is that around the same time, early 1990s, uh, my colleague Laurie Koskela, who at the time was still in Finland, um, developed a technical report during a sabbatical at Stanford um, where he looked at the literature very extensively and tried to understand uh, what the different frameworks were that people were using to develop models and, and optimize the problems that they had formulated. And he recognized three different kind of bodies of knowledge. So one is the transformation view on production, which is what we very much um, follow in traditional project management. It's 
transforming inputs into outputs and trying to do that as fast as we can. But separately from transformation, there's also the flow view of production or queuing three theory as it's called <clears throat> in industrial engineering. The flow view of production that says, well, it's all well and good that you transform inputs to outputs, but if there's no customer for your outputs, your outputs are going to pile up. You're going to have a lot of inventory, a lot of stuff in between. Who knows if you're ever going to have a customer for it. So maybe you should also pay attention to these handoffs, <laughs> the in-betweens, and not just on the transformation part. And then the third dimension, of course, is the value part. The value part that says, uh, well, what good is transformation and what good is worrying about the, the in-betweens buffers and the handoffs if you're not creating something that's going to be of value to your customer? So interestingly, the, these three um, views on production very much existed in the literature, but they seem to be disjointed bodies of knowledge. And Laurie's big contribution to our community was to say, you really want to do all three, right? You really you need to do transformation to create something that the customer wants, but you want to do it with, with nothing in stores, right? You want to do it fast, short cycle times, little inventory, and you want to produce something that's really of high quality that the customer is happy to pay for. So that was a big um, aha moment. And the other uh, sort of independent evolution at the time was Glenn Ballard's work. So Glenn Ballard um, had started off as a, a pipe fitter in the industrial engineering realm and then moved out from, in, from industrial facilities, industrial construction, uh, moved into um, crew leadership and then became a productivity improvement consultant over time. And he realized that many times, you know, as he was working as a pipe fitter, he was giving assignments that were just not doable. They didn't have the right instructions. They didn't have the right materials. Um, they didn't have access to the right space to do the work. They didn't have the right tools. And so, you know, he had kind of come to this, this synthesis that said, you know, if, you, if you're going to make assignments, you need to make sound assignments. You need to remove the constraints. Um, you need to make sure that people know what it is they're going to do. Um, you need to make sure that they have the resources and the capacity to do it. So that the, the ideas of the last planner system kind of were germinating in the 1980s. And then uh, in 1994, Glenn wrote a paper on this first paper on the last planner system. Um, so back to back to Michigan. Um, <clears throat> so I was working on on social technical systems and looking at the broader materials management aspects. Um, as after um, six years there, um, I took a sabbatical. I realized that the literature wasn't going to help me enough to really understand what happened in industry. And I ended up on a large oil refinery project in Houston along the Pasadena Ship Channel. I had read the literature. I had read a CII report about materials management. CII had used a specific company, HP Zachary, as the exemplar of a really good materials management system. And so I thought, if I'm going to learn something, I need to go learn from the best. <laughs> Why don't I try to get on a project with HP Zachary? And uh, I was fortunate that their head of materials management, Jim Goodwin, um, allowed me to basically take a take a chair, take a desk um, <laughs> next to him on this this very large uh, oil refinery project. I was there at the time. So this is 95, 96. I was there to help figure out uh, with the newest technology, barcodes, <laughs> laser based positioning systems. Uh, try to figure out how people manage their laid on yards and if there was a way to to do it better with with automated systems. And obviously all these technologies were in their infancy at the time. So there was a lot of testing, a lot of um, trial and error uh, to make it work. But um, it was it was fun. I chased a lot of pipe and steel. <laughs> 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 tried, tried to find it in many different locations. Um, so after that, um, I joined the faculty at, at, uh, at UC Berkeley. And I remember the summer before the semester started having lunch with Glenn and, and um, and just telling him, it's like, Glenn, I, I don't quite understand this. As an academic, I didn't know much about materials management. Um, I spent a year in the industry to find out from a very good company <laughs> what the best practices are. And lo and behold, they have all this pipe and steel, and it's there in the Houston sun, sunning for, for weeks, for months, you know, <laughs> for the longest time. This is really not working very well. You know, I thought I would I would have discovered the secret, but <laughs> you know, we're far we're far from having the secret. And so Glenn then explained to me, you know, what was happening uh, in the industry, kind of in a nutshell, as in 
you know, well, if you don't have a stable construction schedule, it's very hard to supply materials to match the construction schedule. But likewise, of course, if you have a lot of variability in your supply chains, it's really hard to supply, even if your your construction schedule would be would be steady, right? It's hard to have a construction schedule if you have unreliable supply. So, you know, we started this conversation about, you know, we need to we need to work, as Glenn called it, behind the shield, right? Stabilizing production at the construction site. And at the same time, we really need to manage that inflow of the different flows to the work phase to to stabilize, right? We need to we need to attack um, variability. I think it's worth noting, Iris, that uh, you know when I started this journey of construction so many years ago, we had uh, cutting edge technology at the time. When I started, was a fax machine, and uh, <laughs> e email was just coming online, and we were still getting RFIs by mail, and we were mm -hmm. still getting RFIs by fax, and uh, that was twenty ish plus years ago. Mm -hmm. And so the schedules were printed on large sheets and they had, they had to pull like a nail and a string down to see where you were in the current data date. And then they were filling in the prints by hand to show mm -hmm. progress. But there is massive variability that, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and it wasn't even time efficient to, 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 to print out these giant schedules it took so much time that it wasn't effective or cost efficient for projects to print these out with any kind of regularity back, you know, that time ago. But, and that's when it was simpler when 16 to 25 contracts could do say a $70 million project. And now today you're upwards of 120 contracts to do a project of the same dollar size. So you have more communication channels to manage more supply chain. That's more uh, specialized. And so you're introducing so much more complexity to project schedules. So the problem is getting with increased specialization, the problem is getting harder unless you introduce a framework that limits work in progress or a pool system like we have in last mm -hmm. planner or the agile frameworks like scrum or simple, even mm -hmm. Kanban. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like, it's fascinating that all the things that you mentioned were problems back in the eighties and nineties are mm -hmm. still problems today. <laughs> we have not solved those problems. And we don't have a, a magical cure, I think, because you still you have so many people coming into the industry, you have people leaving the industry, and that knowledge transfer isn't uh, one for one because of how people learned. Everybody today, Iris, I guarantee you, still they're still grabbing the mouse, mm -hmm. even if uh, better practices mm -hmm. exist or standards exist. Mm -hmm. So that's it's fascinating to hear that. That's still so problematic. Yeah, it, and I mean, I, let's not critique the mouse too much, right? In the sense that I think people need to buy into what they see on the computer, right? We don't right. want to be in control. We don't want to be, as my, my colleague, former colleague, uh, Greg Howell would say, we don't want to be the helpless victims of fate, right? We do we do want to understand what the computers do. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you know, we have a lot of power to to engineer the production system, right? To to structure the designs, to structure the handoffs, to structure the tasks, so that we can, you know, create create reliability in the system. I, you know, so many people say, oh, our industry is so complex, you know, and it's becoming increasingly complex. And you know, my my thought has always been, well, yes, our systems are complex, but part of the complexity is what I would call self-inflicted complexity. <laughs> we make them complex, right? And then right. we make them complex and then we complain that the thing is complex. You know, the reality is you can simplify, <laughs> you can drive out some of that variability. So, I mean, back to this example on, on, the, on the, this project in Houston, um, you know, pipe spools are all one of a kind, right? Engineers like to engineer. My colleague John Giro would have said architects like to architect. You know, we like to generate value, right? We like to right. we like to do unique things. But we have to think about whether creating everything to be unique is actually helping to create value or whether it's going to kill us in the degree of complexity that we're creating as a result. So I developed a, a, a fun uh, computer simulation model, actually, uh, with some data that Glenn Ballard and Greg had collected on a number of CII projects about the piping function and how people were managing the deliverable of, of uh, design documents, isometrics, and 
how they were then managing the production of pipe spools and then delivering them to site. I used some data from that report and created a discrete event simulation model. And the model specifically addressed this problem, what I call of matching components. So if every pipe spool is unique and if every location on your oil refinery is unique as well, you have to match the product just so. And if for some reason, you know, a piece is missing, you probably cannot complete the work on the assembly. Right? right. So all that said, you know, of course, if you can make things more substitutable, then the matching problem is alleviated and the complexity in your production system is reduced and it becomes much easier to manage. So I, I my computer simulation model has some very um, convincing, I think, data to show that uh, reducing product variability really helps with reducing um, process complexity in managing. And it does. It's, it's, I mean, it's of course something we know, but we don't necessarily intentionally <laughs> pursue that, that lesson learned uh, as we design and as we create our production systems. That's right. And I want to just like remind everybody that I'm sitting here with a decade of experience in the last planner system and every project that I've had experience deploying it on has gained schedule time and has either met or exceeded by exceeded. I mean, did better than what the original schedules had predicted. So, and that's even today. I mean, as recent as a week ago, it still, <laughs> it still delivers such a high reliability as compared to the alternative. It's just where if you, if you just let things alone and you think of that very linear approach, you're going to have undue complexity to use your language or just projects are going to take longer. <laughs> and, and we do like to complain about why they take so long. <laughs> that is actually true that you can, there are, there are tools and things that we've learned from research that you've done with a lot of the people that you've mentioned that has been transformational into making project delivery more reliable. I've experienced it firsthand. Yeah. They're old ideas, but they work, right? right. <laughs> so it's, I think it, I use them every day and, uh, you know, I can highly encourage other people to use these practices as well. But it, it's hard to be, it's hard to not introduce frivolous variability, right? Frivolous variability is in, oh, you know, I didn't think about it. I'll just go do something else. <laughs> it's very hard for people to standardize and be very rigorous with their standards. People tend to be creative and we want to go do some different things. <laughs> or we don't like, uh, like Glenn had said before, we don't give people clear expectations of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And so they have to innovate on the fly, which is not mm -hmm. always going to be more productive if we let people step back and think about what they're going to do before they actually go forward and do it. We often just say, go get it done. Mm -hmm. And we don't say, think about it for 10 minutes and then go do it. Right. And the other thing we don't mention is to, to think about where, where we all fit within the systems that we work in, right? And and that your performance can only be as good as the system's performance can be. I mean, if, if you work faster, but the bottleneck is somewhere else, you're working faster isn't going to help. Right. It's just going to wear me out. I'm going to get tired. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that systems view is, is typically ex lacking. And I think that's, that's one of the perspectives, certainly that lean thinking is, is trying to advocate, right? It's about seeing the whole and, and as it as it talks about seeing the whole, of course, as you expand the problems to be more and more comprehensive, it becomes increasingly impossible to solve them from an optimization perspective, right? So you have to look at satisfying solutions and you have to be clear as to what criteria you're going to use to determine what's satisfactory or not. Sometimes even thinking about constraints, some people see constraints only as negative, but there are such a thing as enabling constraints. I've read uh, some of the work of Dave Snowden in his mm -hmm. complexity theory, Kenevin, and he mm -hmm. talks about setting up constraints to enable things like scaffolding, just like we do in mm -hmm. the scrum framework or in last planner system with having five, con five connected conversations in a certain sequence. Mm -hmm. When they're done in that sequence, you've created enabling constraints or scaffolding that allows for information to flow and people have the opportunity to plan logistical flow like you mm -hmm. talked about, especially that, uh, the site setup, that site setup is, I think something that, uh, is totally worth exploring. If you're on a construction project now mm -hmm. and your job is behind schedule, take a look mm -hmm. at the flow of how your site is set up 
-hmm. probably have a lot of excess inventory. And a lot of that is people just being protective, having some additional buffers because mm -hmm. there's more uh, sporadic, chaotic scheduling calls for materials and nobody wants to be caught not having things readily available. Yeah. And people like to stake out turf, right? They try to get ready and, and, and then block others from doing the work that they do. And then oftentimes back to the, the system thinking, right? We don't really understand where the constraint is. And so there may be resource constraints that could be alleviated, but we don't see them and everybody kind of suffers through them. Yep. And you have uh, internal pressures on every single company needing to hit their mm -hmm. numbers. And those production numbers are not optimized for complete project throughput because they don't have the visibility of the full project needs. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They don't have the visibility and they don't they don't have the information, right? So so you know, when I when I joined the faculty, obviously um, at Berkeley, the, obviously this discussion around last plan are very much resonated with what I had seen uh, it, on this large project in Houston. Um, the other thing um, that I had the opportunity to get involved is, is Glenn Ballard at the time was working with Todd Zabel, and Todd had a roofing company called um, Pacific Contracting. And um, I remember hanging out with, with Todd and Glenn on uh, San Francisco airport board, boarding areas A and G <laughs> as Todd was putting in uh, new roofing work. And Todd, you know, had very much understood that, you know, as a contractor, they were oftentimes lacking information and lacking specification on the methods that they needed to use to, you know, apply multiple layers. And of course, if you're a roofing contractor, it really matters that you do good work because if there's a leak in a building, um, it's your fault. And so Todd had moved into um, modeling things in, in great detail, right? In, in AutoCAD and then, then later on in three-dimensional um, representations to really to, to define the design from this, more general architectural description all the way down to a step-by-step -step procedure specification for what is the worker going to do on site. And so that uh, that greatly helped in completing the picture as to, you know, what are we expecting workers to do? Now, for people that don't know, uh, roofing drawings in architectural plans require a lot of math in order to fully understand what's going on, just the nature of how it's depicted mm -hmm. in two dimensions mm -hmm. with the slope. And uh, it doesn't always calculate out as designed mm -hmm. because of, <laughs> of nuances and little changes and tolerances mm -hmm. that can add up. So I think that's it's worthwhile to model it and, and find mm -hmm. all the, mm -hmm. the special points. And it's, I mean, it's true. You mentioned tolerances. That's one of my <laughs> my favorite topics to talk about too. You know, you mentioned tolerances. So, so oftentimes when we develop our computer models, our building information models, there's very little indication about the fact that there are tolerances, right? The fact that there will be dimensional variation. And that you, you know, as Todd said, you know, that buildings leak at the intersection of contracts. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's it's true, right? It's you you have to you have to understand that different trades work to different tolerance requirements, and you know what the American Concrete Institute specifies isn't necessarily in line with what the the Institute of Steel Construction specifies, and so. Um, you know, up until relatively recently, actually, the standard, for example, for anchor bolts in concrete were not in alignment. <laughs> and so you, you start off with a problem, right? Because every trade builds to their industry's tolerance expectations and standards. And if from the get-go they're not aligned with one another, you're going to have problems. Somebody has to compromise. If they're in conflict... And who's going to give? Then you're going to have uh, the authorities having jurisdiction have to weigh in. Mm -hmm. And so it depends on who you get. There's more <laughs> variability and how that's going to get resolved. That's right. That's right. And if you're the last the last kid to, on the block, the last one to do the work, then you you need to get out the grinder, right? Or you need to get out the caulking to fill the gaps. I mean, yes. Those are <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> right, part of our standard practices. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just laughing because that's happened more times than I can count on a project where we've got all this additional scope for caulking or mm. remedial work just to put contract work in place because it's just, it's all within contract, but it doesn't fit, doesn't work. 
So this is what I mean with production system design, right? If we begin to understand what the problems are, certainly we can we can try to alleviate them, right? Try to design our system such that these problems are much less likely to occur. So we don't have to get the grinders out. Right. Back to the systems thinking in the early, um, well, actually, in the, also in the 1990s um, in California, there was a Senate bill 1953 that basically created a, a crisis uh, in the industry. And again, one of our sayings, you know, is, you know, never let a good crisis go to waste. Right? <laughs> That's right. Um, the, the crisis that was created with, with the Senate bill and with the, the Associated Government Association called OSHBOD, the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, was that the state of California wanted to have all large hospital owners who had acute care facilities uh, ascertained that their acute care facilities would not only remain standing after a major earthquake, but also remain fully functional. And on top of that, um, the owners were mandated to either upgrade their facilities or to demolish and rebuild um, to that to that new standard within you know very strict um, time limits, which basically. Um, led all the owners to begin to think about how can we actually get enough attention of the architects and of the engineers and of the builders in our industry who do healthcare construction? How can we, how do we get their attention so we have the capacity to actually comply with the state's uh, regulatory um, requirements? Uh, among all the different owners was Sutter Health, a large organization in Northern California, but in the state of California, certainly not the largest healthcare provider, was you know, one of the players um, thinking about the fact that because there was going to be such tremendous demand on architects and engineers and builders to, to upgrade these facilities, that they might be, they might not find the best companies to work with. And the big aha moment that they had was to think maybe there is a different way in which we can interact with our design and construction community. Maybe there is a way that we can become the owners of choice so that we don't have to go beg these companies to work for us, but conversely, they will come to us because they want to work for, for us. And so Lean, <clears throat> Lean became kind of the, the big um, aha moment for Sutter Health. They said, let's figure out how we can become Lean owners, how we can deliver our facilities in a Lean fashion. And so they, they challenged um, the construction industry to, um, to adopt Lean practices. As part of the the um the transformation that they were after they actually made it mandatory for every construction company and every design firm that worked for them to have a lean coordinator and all the lean coordinators across their project had to have dinner once a month <laughs> to talk to one another and share the lessons learned at the beginning Sutter Health would very generously pay for a dinner and then of course the attendance grew and <laughs> people like myself began to attend as well yeah. Uh, and then the, the baton was passed to different companies to, to pay the bill as well. But it was really a brilliant, a brilliant move to bring the community together. And I remember I was actually present at the dinner where, you know, different architects, different um, engineers, different contractors were complaining about how awful Oshpod was, right? Oshpod is kind of, <laughs> has been a really, a really bad word. And I remember, um, I believe it was Carl Sher Sherman from Sutter Health kind of standing up and saying, well, isn't this a little bit um, ironic? You know, we talk about working together as a team and here we are, you know, designers, engineers, builders with the owner. We have everybody in the room except Oshpod. Why is Oshpod not here? And he stepped out and invited Oshpod to come to the dinners so we could talk about the problems that we had and the problems, of course, generally speaking, being the problems of our industry, right? There right. was a lot of finger pointing at Oshpad, but it was really the problem of the industry. And John Gillingerton, um, who was the deputy head of, of Oshpad, came to the dinner and basically said, listen, um, you know, I know, I know that Oshpad is taking a long time to, to do the review. 
Um, but, you know, we, we have staffing challenges and these reviews are just incredibly complex because you need to look at the entire system perspective, right? After an earthquake, is your building going to remain fully operational? There are many systems that need to interact. <clears throat> this is really complex. Um, it was very difficult, of course, once people had developed a lot of competence in that area, the private industry would hire them away and so Ashpod could start all over again with training, uh, <laughs> training personnel. So it was a real challenge. And I remember an architect in the room kind of being rather angry and sort of commenting. It's like, well, but why, you know, when I, when I send in my drawings for review to Oshpod, right, why does it take six months for you to review them and then get back to me and basically say, well, you're missing this and this and this piece of information, right? Couldn't you have looked earlier? Couldn't you have commented on that earlier? Why do you have to wait six months? And then the room got very quiet. And the room got very quiet because everybody began to think, why should we blame Oshpot for that, right? If you submit drawings that are incomplete, you created the problem. <laughs> and don't, don't blame Oshpot for it. So there was a, a turning moment in, in the industry. So we took the challenge, uh, Paul Reiser from Bold, Glenn, uh, and myself kind of took the challenge and said, well, what we really, really need is bring the industry together, right? There's Sutter Health, but of course, all the healthcare providers have the same problem. Um, and there's a lot of companies that work for Sutter, but the number of other companies that work across the industry. Let's actually figure out what it is that Oshpot wants. And that was basically the start of what we call our Project Production Systems Lab at UC Berkeley. So in 2005, uh, with the sponsorship from Bolt and other companies, we actually launched a number of uh, planning meetings where we developed value stream maps, the value stream map to design and deliver the handoff to Oshpot for a 100-bed hospital. We were set up in four different rooms in Fairfield. Uh, every room had an Oshpot representative, and then we broke up the other participants to, to build more or less equal teams. And then we dug in and we began to develop a current state value stream map for how you deliver a 100-bed hospital. And then over the course of four weeks, we actually got to a future state value stream map as well. So that spurred you know, a wonderful conversation in the industry where people began to realize that you know, if, if Oshpod, if we submit incomplete drawings to Oshpod, Oshpod is gonna get back to us. We'll have a back check, right? If we try to shorten the cycle by submitting our drawings even earlier. Our drawings are going to be even more incomplete. And so there will be not one, but perhaps several back check cycles, right? The system was spiraling all the way down and just getting worse and worse with review cycles taking way, way too long. And so with that, that P2SL um, planning exercise, kind of on neutral ground, right? We were able to, to help foster that conversation in the industry to, to talk about understanding the system and understanding the multitude of different customers in the system and understanding that, you know, your first customer of design obviously is the regulatory agency. And of course, you know, construction comes and of course the owner comes afterwards, but there are a multitude of, of customers and we need to tailor our deliverables to, to meet the requirements of these customers. We documented a nice case, you know, with Sutter Health where they actually changed the way they were coloring up their building information model to make small compartments, for example, very visible to really cater to a fast um, Oshpod review. And then all kinds of other practices uh, stemmed from that. So Oshpod didn't necessarily have the latest building information modeling technology, but the design team could actually lend a person with a computer <laughs> to run the latest information technology while sitting next to an Oshpot person to help with the review, for example, so that Oshpot wouldn't have, you know, a pile of thousands of drawings to, to go through. So there's a lot of a lot of good ideas um, were implemented as, as a result of that. And that launched that launched our project production systems lab. So we have been kind of a neutral ground for industry where people can come together. They can take their project hats off. They don't have to be uh, defending their title or their position or their claims uh, on any one project. And we've been um, very um, encouraging to have you know good good conversations and really tackle uh, industry challenges. Yeah, P two S L is uh, someplace I got to visit. Uh... UC Berkeley myself some years ago, and that's where I learned about uh, tact planning, mm -hmm. 
which at that time was introduced as the sixth conversation inside of Last Planner System hmm. to get an even more reliable schedule mm -hmm. using different uh, techniques like line of balance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and location-based scheduling. And mm -hmm. it uh, it colored and changed my approach to Last Planner System ever since. Mm -hmm. It got uh, much better. And I've recently mm -hmm. taken a trip abroad to visit my counterpart at uh, BMW in Bavaria and Germany in mm -hmm. Munich and mm -hmm. gotten to see what they've been able to accomplish with tag time on construction projects, not mm -hmm. uh, automobile mm -hmm. lines. Mm -hmm. And it is incredible to see the reductions in schedule time. And again, it's like having that focus on the planning cycle, designing mm -hmm. your production system. And the crazy thing is it doesn't take a lot of time to set it up. Mm -hmm. It's very fast. And that I would say that the learning curve to even deploy it is an investment of maybe a couple of days and then a day or two of noodling. And then mm -hmm. you can bring your trade partners in, review a draft schedule that's far less complex than a hundred plus page mm -hmm. thousand activity critical path method schedule. Mm -hmm. And so that came from research. And I, I, we, we were talking the other day and I asked you, how many years have you been studying TACT? And research. So I was fortunate again to um, to learn about TACT from from a project uh, the Women's and Children's Hospital in Sacramento, where Bolt um, was trying to gain time on their schedule in building the exterior works. And so um, I think again, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, they they thought they really needed to try something different and explore a multitude of different options. And so they ended up using TACT with with amazing results. Um, I don't had the chance. I went back to to Sutter here in the Bay Area, and I asked for some projects that you know we we had liked to study with with my students in class and and with our research. And um, James Pease responded with one project, although it was a little bit too far along uh, at the time for us to do any kind of intervention, any kind of experiments. But then another project came along, uh, the Mills Hospital and the Mills Peninsula Hospital, and the project team was just just um, kind of deciding what kind of lean practices they were going to use on their project. And James Pease introduced um, my students and me to, to the project team, talked about TACT, what we wanted to try, and um, you know the project team bought on. And um, so we used TACT in, as a way to structure the phase schedule. And then we use TACT, of course, in, in execution uh, of the project. I wouldn't call that first experiment um, Truly tact planning, it was it was a complex, it was small, but but a rather complex gut and remodel project. So in a traditional sense of tact planning, tact planning is often used um, in in um, like hospitals where you have many rooms that are the same or hotels or, or ship, you know, building uh, where you have many components that are physically the same or very similar. Uh, the project that we looked at uh, didn't have that much similarity from a from an architectural perspective, from a product component perspective. But um, I realized at the time that product component um, repetition didn't really matter uh, because we have skilled craftspeople and they have a multitude of skills. They can do many different tasks. So I came through that experiment, through the realization that we really needed to focus on what's called work, what I called work density. And work density is, you know, for a given area, a given scope of work with your crews, means and methods, you know, prefabrication strategy, whatever you have in mind, how much time are you going to spend in that specific area? And if we can capture that for all the different trades, right, we can begin to balance those times, right? I call these, these times workloads or work densities. We can begin to play with these numbers. We can change the zoning of the site. So even out the workloads across the different trades. And we can also begin to think about um, trade-offs, right? If I invest a little bit more, maybe to prefabricate a component somewhere else, perhaps it costs more, maybe not, but perhaps it costs more to prefabricate. If I can prefabricate, if I make that investment and I can lower the work density on site, I may be able to actually get everybody to work faster in a, you know, a faster tact in a, in a shorter cycle time on the project itself. So right. through work density, we can have some, some really useful conversations about system design. And through that work density, it doesn't mean that the workers have to perform quicker or harder. Mm -hmm. It just, uh, it actually allows them to perform at an even pace. And this is what uh, 
I got to learn in Germany with the the metaphor of the trains mm -hmm. and the tack wagons. The same mm -hmm. exact thing as you're calling the density. We just set mm -hmm. the the wagon size to a certain size. Maybe your wagon is this big. Maybe it's this mm -hmm. big, mm -hmm. depending on the the crew mix. Maybe mm -hmm. one wagon has a single crew, and another wagon of a a of, of different uh, production values might require two or three crews to balance in size mm -hmm. to the one crew. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you get the uniform wagon size and then you create this magical throughput. That's mm -hmm. just incredible to see. And so I, I recommend, I mean, there's videos online to see tax simulations on YouTube. So people go out there, check that out or read the mm -hmm. IGLC papers. And I just recently had somebody on the show, Iris uh, Pete, mm -hmm. I believe was the project manager of that Sutter project where they started using tact on the exterior. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, his superintendent was just so determined. I think his name was Dan Murphy. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yes. I know Dan. Sure. Yeah. Yes. He said Dan Murphy was so determined that he was going to make it work, that he tried mm -hmm. something like 11 times and failed mm -hmm. before it worked. And then when yep. it worked, it was like magic. Mm -hmm. And he knows, and he, you know, as a superintendent, I mean, sort of regardless of what the, owner requires you know regardless of of other scheduling systems that you know are contractually um, mandated or preferred you know he will tack his job right you know it makes it makes such good sense to have these smaller chunks of work to have to have smaller zones to be much more clear about the handoffs right to have uh, rapid feedback you know if you have a two-day tact in a zone after one day, you already know whether it's quite likely or not that you're going to finish in day two. In day two, you know whether you finished or not. You can immediately respond to any corrections that are needed. Um, there's sort of this economy of multiples, right, that that really begins to to play to your advantage. And um, it, it does wonders, as you say. It yeah. does wonders. I, That's heard. Not, I think there's a lot there's a lot still to be learned on tech planning. And as you know, from from colleagues in, in other country, also colleagues in the United States on, you know, different people in industry, Dan Murphy and, and, and others uh, who are using tech planning. Um, there are many, many different ways in which people are using tech planning, of course, because the context of the projects in which they work are different and the trade partners involved, of course, have major input in how the tech plan can be developed and unfolds. So I think there's 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 so much more to learn about tax planning. I'm, I'm very excited about about the prospect of of documenting more cases and running more experiments. Oh, we're definitely going to. <laughs> we are definitely going to. This is the this is what uh, Pete said from his perspective is the new wave of what's mm -hmm. going to sweep across the industry and really accelerate lean adoption because it is just it's just so much better for it handles the the worker crisis of the shortage it handles uh, a lot of the safety issues where people don't have to work at uh, abnormal paces the mm -hmm. reliability is so much higher the clients love it because they get much more reliability on the plan and they can focus mm -hmm. the transition into the buildings or the structures mm -hmm. much more reliability i mean everybody wins and, mm -hmm. and the people that do it like the trade partners they are much more profitable because the the constraints are being removed and the work that they're able to do is much higher quality. I've, I've heard from the our partners overseas in Europe that punch lists are completely eliminated or mm -hmm. minimized to very minor things, mm -hmm. to almost nothing, mm -hmm. which is like incredible. Like that that's one of the things that robs mm -hmm. people of mm -hmm. like uh, financial and uh, employee morale. When they when they do defective work because the system is forcing them to, right, right, or the frustration that they have because, as I mentioned, you know, Glenn Ballard's early experiences before the last planner is, you know, you want to do good work but you don't have the right instructions and so you have to kind of make it up on the fly and do something and then it turns out it's wrong or you don't have the material and you have to put something you put a temporary structure in and then you have to come back later to fix it you know to do it right I mean it, it, it's all frustration that's really not not good right right what do you see from your perspective for people that think lean is too academic in other words they believe it's something that's lectured about but it doesn't work in the real world what would you say to those people <laughs> um, there's a famous saying that's nothing quite as practical as a good theory 
you know, there's there's a there's a lot of a lot of science. There's a lot of you know there is a field called production science. Um, so there's a lot of science that's available to be used if people want to use it. So in that sense, certainly I would highly encourage people to to read the academic papers from you know the International Group for Lean Construction and and so many other places. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, theories need to be tested, right? They need to be grounded in practice. Um, I think Taichi Ono, when he developed over, you know, 30, 40 years at Toyota, the Toyota production system, I think that was all grounded in, in good practical application, but not just application. I think what came with the application was a systematic approach, right? The plan, do, check, act of continuous improvement. So it's a repeated execution to make sure that you have process capability that you can reliably execute, that you have predictable outcomes. So you can standardize your processes and you know what the output is going to be. And then once you standardize your processes, then you can do experiments by changing your processes and, and you know, try to, to find improvements to it, right? So, but that's a very systematic process that gets applied in practice if people you know, if, if people want to become good learners, um, Lean has a lot a lot to offer in that regard. Absolutely. And I see, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. From mm -hmm. my perspective of studying this for over a decade, Lean is a synonym with learning when you get really mm -hmm. deep into it. It's that learner's mindset that is mm -hmm. the, what I argue is the natural state of human beings, highly mm -hmm. adaptive creatures that we are. That's what we need to encourage to have more of. And I just saw yesterday on Twitter, nine o'clock at night, my time in California, mm -hmm. which was, I think it was like, uh, it was Sunday. Mike Rother tweeted, Mike Rother famously developed the Toyota Improvement Kata. He tweeted a paper from IGLC published in, I think it was Peru, uh, researchers working on a construction project site using the Toyota Improvement Kata to get the complete last planner system implemented. Mm -hmm. And it and it showed that it happened with success very fast, much more rapidly versus the traditional ways that last planner is deployed. So I just thought like, what, what fitting that I'm seeing a tweet mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. Mike and Mike studied it uh, in Michigan too. What school? He was in industrial engineering, right? I mean, he worked with Jeff Liker. They had a big yeah. um, automotive manufacturing program in the early 1990s. So another, a lot of magical things happening all over the United States and academia, helping mm -hmm. projects even to this day. <laughs> the academic world, the academics, I think, are the, the providers of the new generation of people entering our industry. You know, engage, engage academics on your projects and, you know, let's, let's learn together. Let's use these bright minds, um, the openness that our students have to explore better ways of, of working. It's been a pleasure and a treat, and I am ready and excited and engaged to go learn some more. Thanks for having me. It's, it's been a real pleasure. Very special thanks to my guest. I'm Felipe Engineer Manriquez. The EBFC show is created by Felipe and produced by a passion to build easier and better. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, everybody. Let's go build.